and welcome to our podcast at Get Legally Speaking. Our legal conversation today will be about consumer law and your rights. I am here today with barrister Mr Tim Sampson from Lamb Chambers in London. Tim is a senior barrister who is regularly instructed to deal with disputes in the High Court and he also works on serious disputes in the County Court. Additionally, Tim lectures and writes on specialist areas of law and he has taught on professional training courses run by the BPP University. Thank you for joining us, Tim. Thank you, Hattie. Okay, so let's kick this off. First question about consumer law, Tim, is, and lots of people want to know this, because you see this on, on lots of different areas in life, you know, even on crisp packets, you know, your statutory rights are not affected. So let's start with, with the first question of what is meant by statutory rights? What does that mean? Well, there are, and always have been, protections for consumers um, going back over many, many decades, but it is easier uh, for the consumer to understand their rights if they're codified into acts or regulations. And over the years, those have developed. So now we have the Consumer Rights Act, which covers a whole gamut of legislation that's now been put to one side because it's regarded as outdated. There is some older legislation still. There's still the Consumer Protection Act, but that deals with damage that's caused by defective goods. What we're really focusing on today are your rights in respect of goods and services. And then if we have time, we're also going to look at the Consumer Contracts Regulations, and that deals with circumstances where you either buy something at a distance from the seller, so on the phone, online, or it's away from the trading place of the person making the sale to you. So for example, if the builder comes to your house, looks around and says, yes, I can do you a nice extension, that contract is being formed away from that trader's normal place of work. Right. But that's um, a different issue to goods and services under the Consumer Rights Act. And one of the things I would say, people can get very het up about the idea of consumer rights, statutory rights. The best protection you can get as a consumer in many ways is just to apply some common sense. Most of the time, if you're dealing with a reputable retailer or reputable service provider, you have no issues. Your statutory rights are there, but you'll never need them. So what are we saying, what are statutory rights? They're legal rights then, that protect the consumer yes. in different they, they, buying situations. They, they codify your rights. So it's very clear to you what the retailer or the service provider must do for you. And more importantly, if things go wrong, what they are obliged as a matter of law to do. It's very hard for the trader to say, oh, you don't have a right to a refund when the law says, yes, you do. Yes, that, that's actually quite a common one, isn't it? Because you do get retailers, for example, probably more high street, I, well, I don't know, probably online as well, where they say, oh, we won't, we won't um, give you a refund, but we'll give you an exchange. And you automatically think, well, that's obviously got to be correct. But are we saying statutory rights are your legal rights that go across the board? Every retailer has to abide by these rights to give you protection as the consumer. Yes, and there are, as we will see when we get into looking at the specifics of the Consumer Rights Act, there are certain time limits for doing things. Yeah. So you have a right to reject. And in that's four, very important, in, isn't it? In time 14 days. Time limits are key because, in the law. Because it changes. As you move, the further you get from the point of sale, your rights become ever less. Very early on, if the goods are defective, 14 days, you just take them back and say, they're wrong, I want my money back. The retailer, as long as they are, of course, defective, yes. uh, you're entitled to your money back. No arguments. Beyond that, up to 30 days, um, you have that easy right of, I want my money back. But the further you move away from that period, you then start to have a one-time option for the retailer to repair or replace, subject to certain rules. And then you go out to six months. And it's the and onus... Different areas of the law the, will apply. The onus then falls on you to say actually the goods were defective when I got them. It's not for the retailer to um, say well, they must have been in good condition. So it changes. So going taking that point up, if you get home and you realise the goods are defective, it's no good the retailer saying, oh, you must have damaged them because yeah. the law says it's the retailer's problem. Yeah. Six months out, 
It's that it's your problem to prove that. And then there's the bigger. I mean, there's the other question of what happens if the goods become defective down the line. But should we move on to question two, and then we can go into those points, perhaps when you you know when when we come across other bits. I mean, question two is what is the Consumer Rights Act 2015, and how can it protect me? And I guess we are an answering part of that in what we're saying now, aren't we? Um, well, it is. We, we we've touched on some of the key issues. Now, this replaces. Uh, sale of Goods Act, unfair terms in consumer contracts regulations, and the supply of goods and services. And as you quite rightly told me just earlier today, the Sale of Goods Act, the Supply Act, doesn't exist because it's been re- replaced. And it well, it's replaced because European consumer law required them to move on. At the at, moment, well, at, we're still well, in here. Uh, it needed to move on not just because the pr- consumers expect a higher degree of protection now, but also the whole world of digital products didn't exist. You're looking at acts that were created in the late 70s and early 80s and the drafters of those acts would have been totally bemused if you talked about digital downloads, applications, DVDs. We we were in the world of VHS video being the absolute acme of technology. (laughs) It now looks like something... CDs. CDs are dated now. You know, I got rid of a whole stack of CDs when they still look quite current to me, really. I mean, I don't know whether I'm showing my age. A CD, you know, a musical CD. Now it's Spotify and it's, you know, iTunes and... Even mm. even that wasn't that long ago. It no, doesn't feel like the, that. The first, anyway. C, first CD players commercially available at any realistic price were in the early 80s. I mean, showing my age, because my, <laughs> the, the, fir, the, the, the first CD I ever bought was Dire Straits, Brothers in Arms. Oh, my God. And what st- year was that? Do you remember that? Now, that uh, would be impressive. 83. Oh, my and, and it's, God, and, it, and it's still a fine album. I was... Where was I? I was in primary school, so that's all good for us. But so Right. So we've got the new Consumer Rights Act... 2015, uh, it now deals with everything that was covered by the earlier acts, but it also brings in digital products. And and it's a catch-all act, so it's not just goods, it's services. And that means if you've got a contract that's for both goods and services, it's also captured. So, for example, uh, a service could be the man that comes to clean your windows, um, someone who provides goods and services would be the firm that comes and puts replacement double glazing in for you because there are two aspects to that. One is the physical goods supplied, the double glazing unit, but also the replacement work requiring the old window to be taken away. and the new a service. Uh, so there's a service element as well, but it doesn't matter. This is a one-stop shop for Act. all your goods and services. Right. Does this, I mean, and obviously this covers online purchases, Online purchases are dealt with in a, a, across, in fact, into the regulations that we'll look at, the distance selling regulations. The critical feature of uh, digital products, which I said were within the, within the Act, is this, that it's obviously much more difficult uh, for the retailer, retailer to know exactly whether they're goods supplied, the digital service, is in fact defective. So you have slightly lower level of rights in terms of demanding your money back. Because, of course, it's, you can imagine... Are you talking about downloading something now? Yeah, maybe yes, a film or yes. something like that? Uh, if it's defective, you're entitled... To, they can repair it and replace it, or if you keep it, which you will do, a, a lowering of the price. But, of course, the danger is the retailer, they supply the digital download, and you say, oh, oh, it was terrible, I want my money back. And you perhaps watched the film by <laughs> you've then, You've watched the or film, to the album or, or you've or poss- possibly stored it somewhere else. Oh, God. So it, it, it can't be used as a mechanism for robbing the retailers. Uh, so the digital provisions, the digital product provisions within the Act do take that into account. They are, it's realistic in terms of what is expected. Although... Some of the aspects, I think one of the things that's very new to the Act was under the old provisions, there were the general standards were that it had to be um, satisfactory quality, but there wasn't much explanation as to what satisfactory quality Mm -hmm. would be. But now, although there's not a complete definition, both in terms of goods and digital service, digital goods, they also have to have uh, provisions in relation to safety and durability. Uh, and it covers both sets of um, product. So, that's so for example, that, that, buying, a, you know, I mean, I do this often, buying children's toys online. 
it arrives and you think, well, this isn't really that safe as I imagined because perhaps the elements that hold the batteries in are a bit loose or whatever, you know, it has to yes, have... Yes, it's, it's that sort of thing. Yeah, fit for purpose. That's a big well, term, well, isn't well, it? Well, well fit, fit for purpose is one of the other categories. There are three categories. It's got to be um, satisfactory quality, which is includes the safety and durability. Fit for purpose is a double-barreled aspect. It must do what you'd expect something to do, or something that you've been promised by the retailer that it that will, it do, will do. do. So, for example, you go and buy um, a kilner jar, that type of sealable jar. Yes. Now, you expect that to be suitable for storing um, food products. Like jams yeah. or something, but you know. if you're not sure, and you say to the retailer, well, it has to be airtight seal. I'm making jam. And the retailer says, yes, yes, of course, it's airtight. Well, it has to do that. Yeah. Because you've been promised that at the point of sale. Yeah. It may not be inherent when you look at it. We think, is this airtight? Isn't it? If you're told it is and you request it, then it has to do that. It has to be fit for the purpose. You can't sell a bucket with a hole in the bottom. It's not yes. going to be fit for Unless purpose. Unless you want a bucket with a hole. Unless, of course, you <laughs> actually specify that. Yes. Um, yes. And that, that comes on to the third point. The goods must be as described or as the sample um, provided to you. Um, and as you, as we know from working together, sometimes it's difficult to always know exactly what you're going to get. You're supplied with a sample. Then there's a question later. Hold on to the sample. <laughs> Hold on to the sample. That, that's, that's the takeaway here, because if something turns up and it's not as the sample was, was mm. don't give the sample back ever. Mm. <laughs> that's my message today, mm. because if ever, ever your goods start fraying from being like the sample, mm. you've got the sample mm. as your proof of this is what I was shown mm. at the point of sale when I agreed to buy these goods. Well, yes, I mean, the, the, of course, we have to remember that we're looking at the Consumer Rights Act, which is a very upfront in terms of getting your money back, getting repair, getting replacement, but your actual contractual rights, your general contractual rights also still exist it may be that you want to sue two or three years down the road you've had That's a kitchen insane. if something goes wrong so don't just think the consumer rights be all and end all they are simply a very convenient mechanism for rapid redress yes but there may be times when rapid redress is not where it's at because it's happened a year down the line you bought, you, you, you bought a car and it's out of warranty but it's clearly defective. Well, the Consumer Rights Act is not going to be the place to start looking. You'll That's be... very interesting because lots of people don't know that then where do I go with this then? Is there any law that protects me? Well, so what would it be in that instance? In that law, you're, at that point, you're simply relying on the general common law contractual right, which, of course, reflect what's in the statute, um, subject to the mitigation. For example, you buy your car. You, you get, do, it's a used car, you have one year's warranty of stand from the garage yeah, that you bought it from. Yeah. Then it starts going wrong in month 14. Well, they'll say, well, that's what you contracted for. That's what you bought. A car, it's a second-hand car, it's got a warranty. Uh, if unless it's some inherently defective issue, for example, it's, um, you know, it's, it's two bits of cars cut and pasted together, and you suddenly discover this, you're entitled to your money back because mm-hmm. you've had a defective Product, but that's not usually the case. If it's something, but it's something fundamental, fundamental that they cannot fix. They cannot the fix it. Satellite just doesn't work ever, no matter what they do. For example, most cars have satellite navigation now, don't they? Yes. So you, you're now into a difficult territory of being able to prove that the goods you were supplied with were defective. Uh, and the sat nav may be a, a, a more difficult issue because the car itself is usually supplied by someone other than the manufacturer of the car. But let's say the engine falls apart. Uh, the pistons go. Now, then you're into the situation, well, is it something that's inherently wrong with the car? Or is it the fact that you've done 180,000 miles of hard yes. driving in it? Yes. At which point, well, the garage said, well, they, you know, we don't guarantee these things to last forever. Forever, yes. There's reason, you know, yes, it must be reasonable quality when we provide it. It must be fit for the purpose, all the rest of it. But, it's also then going to be subject to what you do with the goods later. Yes. Uh, is there actually a breach 
of the contractual terms. If they've promised you the car will run for 200,000 miles and it falls apart at 185,000, you haven't had your money's worth. Mm. You've had some of your money's worth. You're not going to get well, everything back. quite a difficult one, isn't it, though, Tim? Because so many things can go wrong with a car and there's so many things, I think, that you can be protected with, but then there's some things that you can't really, you know... Um, there are incidences where light bulbs just keep popping, for example, mm-hmm. uh, and you're not covered by light bulbs and tyres. You know, you can't sit there and say, well, that tyre keeps attracting hoovering up the nails in the road. There's something wrong with, you know, things like that. But like well, you say, fundamental issues, you can still go back to the law and see how you can be co- protected under contractual mm, terms mm. as opposed to the Consumer Rights Act. Yes. And the, I think that's a really important yeah, point. The Consumer Rights Act is a very, very useful tool as are the regulations that we'll look at for distance selling, for getting immediate redress of the problems, the things that you want. Can I hand the goods back? Is there an obligation to refund me? That's what's going to be my question. Do retailers then have to give you a refund within a certain period of time? And we mentioned 14 days earlier, no matter what they say their policies are, where you see no refunds, do they have to by law? Right. As we said earlier on, this is a it's on a time scale up to 30 days they've got to give you your money back if they, if they up to 30 days no matter what they say even if they have the biggest sign behind their tail saying no refunds no they, they have to give you your money back as, lo- as long as they are in breach of the statutory obligations yes, as long as, yeah. uh, that is uh, the only qualification and it doesn't apply to digital downloads because of the issues we discussed earlier. Yes, i.e. Uh, people you are buy entitled, them, watch them and say, oh, well, they were faulty, I want my money back. You are entitled to repair or replacement, but you can't just automatically have your money back. Now you've got the next step, which is up to 60 days. So you've got to your 30-day limit, and you now yeah. say, well, actually, I want my money back. The shop's entitled at that point to go, we have a one-time option to repair or replace before we offer a full refund. Mm. They have to be given that opportunity. Um, They could, of course, at their own discretion, uh, say, well, actually, we'll give full refunds up to 60 days. Yeah. That's up to them. Yeah. They want to provide that contractually outside of the statute. They're obliged up to 30 days to give you a refund if there's something Mm. fundamentally wrong with the product. Not if you say, I've changed my mind, I want to return it. No, 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 that's something... That's different. We're talking about defective goods yes well, either, either they're not a satisfactory quality they're yeah. not fit for the purpose or yeah. they don't meet the description within 30 days the, the retailer has to give you a re- yes. refund after 30 days they don't have to no. they, they can be given the opportunity to put it right yes they, they have to be given that one time opportunity to put it right um, it's their choice but there are again some qualifications to this um, you can get a full or partial refund even up to 60 days in circumstances where the cost of the repairs would be disproportionate, yeah. and it may well be so that the reason something for fifty pounds, the repairs are going to cost a hundred pounds. Well, it's not commercially well, for, viable for, for, for anyone. Is it? Example: You buy a laptop five hundred pounds, even though it's maybe cheaper than that now. If something goes fundamentally wrong with the motherboard in that computer, the chances are it will cost hundreds of pounds to do a repair job. For something that actually, well, the retail value may be 450 the actual cost to the retailer is probably 150 They can simply say, look, have a, have a new computer or have your money back. Because yes. um, the, there is no purpose in repairing this. Um, and if it's impossible to do the repair job, then again, it's just we're into refund territory. Um, if it would cause you as the consumer a lot of inconvenience... Are you using that for your work? Then they have to offer you the refund. Uh, subject to that, of course, if you hang on to the goods, you're entitled to only a partial refund. Yes, you can't have the goods and, yes. and the money. Yes, no, um, of course. Or it would just take an, uh, an unreasonably long period of time to actually carry out the repairs. Um, and, of course, retailers themselves, reputable retailers, aren't going to be sitting there with a copy of the Consumer Rights Act in front of you. No. Well, how can we squeeze the minimum or provide the minimum service to our client under the law of course i mean most retailers have a genuine desire to have satisfied and happy customers um yes i i I sometimes the bigger brands can be quite tough in how they deal with these situations but i think these takeaways this information Mm. that we're giving today Mm. is, is quite key i mean i certainly never realized years you know a long time ago that that 
I could get a refund within 14 days if the goods were defective. I just thought if the sign was up, you know, saying no refunds, it doesn't matter what the, the situation was, how defective or unfit for purpose the goods may have been, I could, just would not be able to get my money back. And it made me think twice before I buy something from somewhere that says no refunds. Mm -hmm. It's particularly as if it was a place where I wouldn't really go for anything else to go and exchange it for mm -hmm. something else if, if what I had went wrong. No, that's that's really useful to him. I mean, then we've got to our 60 day point. Yes. Now beyond that, we, go, there's, we run up um, up to six months. Now, there are still rights, but there's a catch here. If you go back, as I think we've mentioned this already, but I'll reinforce the point. If you go back to the retail, say, these goods are defective. Or not fit for purpose. Or not fit for or purpose. Not as described, the three the, points. It's up to you to prove that they were in that condition when they were supplied to you by the retailer. It's not for the retailer to prove that they were in good condition. So the burden of proof is now reversed. Right. Um, so you may and that well, can be quite difficult to well, do. Well, really. it, it makes life a lot harder for the consumer. Obviously, you've had all the advantage um, with the presumption in your favour um, up to this point, and quite often goods will betray their default, their faults long before we get to the six month point. But you have to appreciate that as the time goes on, your rights diminish. It's more under the Consumer Rights Act 2015. It, 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 it becomes more and more akin to a normal contractual claim. And of course, for any claim, contract or otherwise, it's always for the claimant to prove their case. Yes. It's no good saying these goods are defective. I can't prove they're defective, but I, I, I promise yes. you, Mr. Judge, they really, really were yes. defective. It's like, no. Uh, you will prove they're defective or you don't have a claim. Yes. Um, so as you go on, it gets harder. You get less automatic right and more burden on proving you are entitled to refund, replacement, repair. Which takes us to our next question, um, which is what is the Consumer Contracts Regulation Act 2013? And we've touched on it by saying, look, as your consumer rights diminish because you're going further and further into the timeline of ownership of your goods, you then can come under the umbrella of the Consumer Contracts Regulation well, Act, that, is well, that that's, right? that's not quite right. Uh, the, the regulations, let's give them their full glorious title, the Consumer Contracts Information Cancellation and Additional Charges Regulations. When did it become so long, Tim? <laughs> um, oh my God. <laughs> well, yes, mo yeah. most people just refer to it as the Consumer Contracts Regulation because they haven't got the time to <laughs> uh, read through the entire uh, statutory name. Yes, but surprisingly. This, and they sometimes get referred to as the distant selling regulations because it's much easier to call them that and actually people understand what it is they're dealing with. <laughs> right. Um, well, tell us about now, that. Now, th these deal, as I said, with two situations. One, where you're buying at a distance, pick up the phone, you say, I want goods X delivered. Or online. Or online. Or where the trader comes to your... As you mentioned your, For earlier. example, your home. Yeah. Although, so you're not going to the trader's office to purchase the goods. So come yeah. round, like you said, to quote for your windows, for your extension, yeah. or provide, yeah. sell you a bed, sell you a sofa. Yeah. It happens. Uh, one qualification I place on this, if you're looking at financial products, there are a whole series of other rules that apply. That's another podcast. That, that, <laughs> that do have some similarities yes. in terms of cooling off periods. Yes, but we will cover that in another but podcast. It's very the important. sale of financial services, pension sales, or whatever, is a very complicated area of law, and it's not covered by Under this. by what we're looking at. Yes, although there are a lot of similarities. Um, so what are we looking at? Uh, what, what does the regulation require? I'm sorry, I've got to be a bit listy here, but I'm afraid these <laughs> no, are important just, points yeah, to clear know. Clear points are always very but good. First thing, you, in terms of the seller, they have to provide you with their address and contact details. Um, because obviously if you're dealing on the phone or online, it's very easy to think, well, I just contacted through the website, and then the website doesn't have any contact details. This should be flashing red lights at this point. You want to know that there's a real entity behind this that you can get hold of. Or otherwise, your rights under the regulation, your rights under the Consumer Rights Act are worthless because you don't know who you're dealing with uh, or there's no one to go after. They've also got to tell you whether they're acting as an agent for somebody else. So they're just the front of house, but actually the so real not the point, manufacturer, yeah. for example. Well, it's not even well, just well, the, no, not even not just that, the manufacturer. It? It's it could be there's a, they are a retailer 
and there's a wholesaler behind them and the retailer right. has no real substance it's just a conduit um, for the goods they also have to provide you with a description of the goods the service the digital content and how long any commitment you've got to them is going to last so you don't just phone up and say I'd like I mean, if you, you know, maybe people the easier way to think about it is when you get your phone contract uh, company phone you got saying, you, do, do you want to renew your subscription all those irritating questions they do and they have to yes. we have to tell you this we have to tell you this about how long it's going to last and then they're like we're just going to read you a script and it goes on for five but, minutes but that but that is all down to what's in these regulations they have to do it because if they don't do it they are then um, in deep trouble if it ever came to an argument about it because it was their responsibility. To make you aware of yes. your rights so they, when you're making the purchase yes. from them. So it, it, however irritating it is when they go into those questions, they've got to do it. Um, but there are, these are useful protections because the next on my list is they have to uh, explain the compatibility of digital content with any other hardware or software that you would have or be reasonably expected to have. So they've got to think well actually before we supply this software is it going to destroy the computer we're going to send it to um, and it responsi oh, the responsibility falls that. on them quite how far you'd never be able to enforce it but at least it makes them ask the question so uh, here's this digital information or whatever it is you're buying they have it's, it's the onus is on the retailer to make sure you've got well, something well to use that not, on? not not so much that but it would have to be compatible with what it is um, you're using. So, for example, if you phone up and say, I want to buy Windows for a PC, and they say, oh, yes, sir, we'll, we'll supply you with a lovely copy of the Apple product. Yes, right, now work. I get you. Yeah. It's useless to you. Yes, yes, yes. It may be a very yes. fine product and yes. work perfectly well, but, they're not giving but it's the you... wrong thing. Yes. But if you told them, you have a PC they can't supply you with something that's not compatible with it um, or you'd reasonably expect not to be compatible um, then we get to the money issue of course how and when payment is going to be made and how is the price going to be calculated if it's not simply a straight the price is X you also of course online want to know when the goods are turning up yes um, that one I find is very common where people have issues where you buy something and then all of a sudden you press pay and it says three to four weeks when you didn't expect that or that's not the kind of picture they painted at the time you're trying to place the goods or find, you know order the goods that that's a good well, problem this whole delivery thing well, I'm not talking about obviously Christmases and things like that I'm talking about just generally well it can be um, but in terms of delivery reasonable time is what you're looking at uh, and three to four weeks I'm afraid Unless there is some absolutely critical this is reason, bespoke made piece of well, bespo bespoke is, is actually a different issue again because the rights are slightly less in terms of bespoke, but uh, maybe not in terms of delivery. But they, they sit in a little product area of their own. But let's say you've ordered something two weeks before Christmas, and it's clear that it has to be delivered for Christmas. Well, it's no good turning up on the tenth of January. No. So although um, a reasonable period might have been normally four weeks if it, it is of the essence that the goods turn up on a particular date or by a particular date then that is the obligation falls on the head of the person who's sending it to you um so but again check what you're being told yes um it as with all these Online. the regulations and rights under the act it they're all well, all well and good and they are a very substantial protection for the consumer because it provides a framework for the honest retailer yes. and it provides a stick to beat the dishonest retailer with or the service provider but of course the best thing of course is never to have to rely on them at all is to understand what it is you're contracting for yeah. And what the other side are expected so to do. It's so easy to get caught out online with online purchasing too. And I mean, I do an incredible amount of online purchasing because it's mm. so convenient. Yeah. And you do, you just go, oh, that's what I want. Yeah, that's the best price on this website. Click, click, click. And then before you know it, mm. you've paid yeah. for something you didn't want really in that time frame or it didn't quite fit what you thought you were doing because we're so rushed yeah, for time and pushed for time. Yeah, and often after the third or fourth glass of Chardonnay, people, people can buy an awful <laughs> lot of things that they don't quite expect to be buying and then yes. they delivered and they think, wait a second, did we order this? Yes. Unfortunately, um, 
you are responsible at that <laughs> point. Um, right. But um, one of the areas, again, that I think we need to highlight, because this is maybe where online sales are critical, if you are old-fashioned like me and you still order CDs, DVDs, software in a shrink wrap license, and for the youth listening, that means a physical thing which comes in a wrapper, um, <laughs> If you order those, um, then you've no right to cancel it because you've had the goods. They, they they still have to be acceptable quality, but you can't just go, I want my money back. Because, of course, the danger is you've taken the software, you've yes. inserted it into your computer and gone, oh, no, that's not what I wanted. Yeah. I'll have that's my money back. Saying earlier. But I'll, I'll just keep it anyway on the yeah. sly. Um, but where it comes quite interesting, I think an area that really people have got no idea about is download which is of course how most people now take their digital content mm. now strictly speaking uh they shouldn't be provided to you for a period of 14 days because that's your cooling off cancellation period and that's what you would expect oh i see so for example an album you bought it online yeah. what you're saying mm. is you pay for it and strictly speaking they should make it accessible to you in 14 days so you've got 14 days to cancel yes. Because once mm. you've had it... You can't cancel. Mm. But of course, we but all want... they do. It's we all, we, we all is want instant. instant gratification. Oh, it is. So the bottom line is that rule is displaced. The moment you download it onto your computer you or to phone, say, um, you don't you know, want unless it. Unless it's defective. And, uh, well, no, because then we're into the consumer rights issue that they're digital goods and therefore you're not entitled to a refund. You're entitled to repair or replacement. And if you has to be repaired and it's still ineffective, you're entitled to a reduction in the price, technically. Mm. But that's all you're going to get. You're not going to be able to go, take it away, I want my money back. Which is, of course, different if you had goods. Um, and I don't think anybody bothers with this idea of waiting for 14 days. Oh, because but, well, they go to another retailer, don't they? Because we, well, we do we're want... subject to the same rules. Well, uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. But we all, we're all, all, you know, such living in a time short, we think we're time short. I think mm. we just make ourselves time short yes. world where you buy something and even with Amazon Prime yeah. where if it doesn't turn up that day or the next day, you start huffing and, and puffing. But that's all we've got time for right. today. And, and I know that we haven't really even touched the surface of the questions that we wanted to get through. But thank you so much Tim don't forget to click and subscribe to our podcasts and you can find us on Twitter Facebook and LinkedIn by searching Get Legally Speaking also visit our website at getlegallyspeaking.com we will most certainly be doing a part two and a part three I think we can do probably part 50s of, of, of this topic of the law and thank you very much for listening thank you very much for listening thank you very much for listening